Good evening. One of the great problems facing the new Premier of British Columbia, and of course all the other politicians here and in Ottawa, is the question of Indian land claims. And it would seem this government's attitude is, well, let's inform ourselves together, that's the Indians and the provincial government, and once the federal government agrees to take total responsibility for all costs, we can go to them hand in hand and negotiate. Will it work? Here's Steve with tonight's rundown. South Africa. The rest of the world is turning up the heat on Pretoria to end apartheid. Today, the European Economic Community supports more sanctions. Tonight on Webster, professor of economics from Cape Town University, Brian Cantor. Also tonight, who owns British Columbia? The BC government refuses to negotiate native land claims until the federal government promises to pick up the tab. The stakes, three quarters of the province. In the studio with Webster, three native leaders. Saul Terry, president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. George Watts, chairman of the New Channel Tribal Council. And Miles Richardson, president, council of the Haida Nation. Gentlemen, there has been much hysteria, much of it uninformed, I'm sure, certainly on the non-Aboriginal side, about what to do about Indian land claims. For many years, people said, nonsense, nonsense, no treaties, forget about it in British Columbia. Now we're faced with a new premier in British Columbia, and I'm going to ask you, George Watts, of the new China, if that's close to right, what do you think of van der Zammer? What are the prospects of trying to negotiate with he and the federal government's reasonable settlements for the land claims in BC, which cover at least 70% of the land mass of this province. Well, Jack, I was interested in uh, Mr. Vanderzam's statements uh, during the leadership campaign in Whistler. One of the things that he consistently brought up was his, uh, his background and his history in Holland when he had to eat uh, tulip bulbs during the war when Germany was occupying Holland. I would tend to think that a person who's gone through that experience will uh, quickly understand and learn about our situation because that's the very situation which we find ourselves in today except for the except for the elements of war we have people occupying our land uh, without our permission uh, we don't feel that we've uh, gotten a fair deal out of it and i'm sure that mr van der Zam, once he spends a few days with our community and and starts to talk to the leaders rather than listening to the poor advice that he's getting now will start to understand what our what our uh, claims are all about and understand that we want to exist as a people much like much like the Dutch people wanted to survive as free people during the Second but World when War. When you say occupying our lands, mm -hmm. I mean the average man on the street, non-Aboriginal, will say what the hell is he talking about occupying our lands? Well, Jack, under, under Canadian law, you're not allowed to go and sit on somebody else's land without their permission or, or to, to occupy their land without purchasing of them. Now, we're not saying that our total concept of land ownership is within Canadian law, but we say that even there's elements of Canadian law which state that you, you've done wrong. So what we're saying now is, is, is that uh, traditionally we, we have lived, uh, for instance, in my case, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and we would like to come to an agreement with all of those people who aren't indigenous, who don't, who don't uh, have find their ancestry in our area, we would like to come to an agreement with them as to how we're going to coexist in the future so that all people can be free. But surely the facts on the face of this land and a couple of hundred years of occupation, if you want to cause it that, makes your position a little more tenuous in that all you can do is hope to negotiate for a reasonable settlement. Well, it certainly doesn't change the facts of history and uh, the rightness of, of our people's positions. If you, you look at the situation we're in right now and you talk about the politicians today, that we have an opportunity in front of us as people who are sharing a common land. We have a very serious situation in front of us that we must deal with. And as our resources are being increasingly exploited, it gets more and more urgent that we deal with this issue. But we, as I'm saying, we do have an opportunity in front of us for solutions. And it's going to take some very serious political leadership, politicians who are willing to take that responsibility for rightness and justice that I hear the Prime Minister and, and others Fairness harping and about. Fairness and sharing and all the rest of it. When well, you come down to the nitty gritty though, is, is it not going to, I'll come to you in a minute, Saul, is it not going to come to the test in the courts? 
you have three cases coming up in court within the foreseeable future which seem to be put through your proper legal challenge for land. Is that no, where you hope to no, win it? That's not where the test is going to be. The test is going to be in the citizens of this country and those people who, who say that they're leading it. Because you can't get down to the situation where you're going to count heads in amongst the majority to determine what the minority or what rights the minority are going to have. What it's going to take in this country is true leadership, people seeing where we want to be 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now. What world do we want to pass on to our children? But in the meantime, and that's not just the Indian children. It's the non-Indian children. What world do they want to pass on? Because if they want to pass on a world of confrontation with the Indian people in this province, that's what they're going to do if they don't resolve the issue. Perhaps on that basis our, culturals, our cultures can't merge because the non-Aboriginal looks at it and says, how much do they want, how much will it cost, what will it do to ownership of land other than the Indians, how much do we have to give to the Indians? Now, is that oversimplifying it, Miles? Is that not what the average non-Aboriginal says? What's it going to cost? Those issues are important issues and they need to be dealt with. Right now we have a serious issue in front of us uh, of the management of the resources of this entire province and I'm, I speak for the Haida Nation and we're concerned about Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands. The, the, at the increasing rate that the resources on those islands are being exploited and alienated from us hurts all people. But are you the only people who know how to manage land? Is it not conceivable that the majority who've set up a tree farm license system and are not defending it also know a bit about it and can, can correct their mistake? Well, you look, at, you look at what's happening to the management of the forest resource. You talk to the unions. You talk to the people who, who depend on those jobs. And we're going to be talking to them very soon also. We're going to be coming up with some, some uh, joint common positions on that. Because not only are, are the native people concerned about these issues of resource management, all of the people who depend on them are. And we have to get down and deal with these issues. If, when we start talking about who legitimately has what share of what resource, right. that's a theoretical argument if there's nothing to, to share. But and, in and, we're, and we're fast moving toward that. Let's go to Salt Terry for a moment, president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. What's the total percentage of land under Indian claim in British Columbia? Well, according to the uh, according to some figures, it's it's in the order of seventy percent, uh, in, excluding some of the uh, treaty areas in Treaty Eight and so on. But uh, I think what we got to come to terms with in this whole process is uh, is three simple points. Number one is the recognition that uh, Indian people um, uh, are of this land and so therefore wish to have recognition of their title and relationship to the land. Also, also, and this is the, it seems to be the crux in all of this thing, is that the, the authority or the jurisdictional questions involved with respect to the lands, the resources, and the people. And uh, that is the area, I think, that, uh, that has to come under some kind of negotiating you process. You, now, you represent about a third of the Indians. You're not involved in any of the major claims as such, like the Council of Haida Nations or the Nuchana. Well, we, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs involves uh, a good number of the bands in British Columbia, and I, I can say in, safely in excess of 100. Is every, is every Indian in, in Aboriginal in British Columbia entitled to part of a land claim, or have you got many members who are not involved in land claims? There are members who are not involved, not because of the fact that they don't believe that they have a right to uh, rights in terms of the land question. I think that they're be, uh, not involved because of the fact of the policies that have been imposed upon Indian people for so long. Well, we're you talking see, we're we've been involved in terms of the question of consent, and I think that's central to, to the discussion that's been going on here. And of course, you'll tell me about how much money and resources have been wasted by this paternalistic Indian affairs which is time it was gone, is it not? Oh yeah, and, and there's a big move on right now behind closed doors to, to make sure that the Department of Indian Affairs lives on. Well, and, all it's, and all it's doing is really is frustrating Indian, Indian people's aspirations and their move towards self-government and their move towards becoming more self-reliant. And, and I think it's time for the taxpayers of this country to start hollering and get rid of that more, Department of Indian Affairs. More with George Watts, Miles Richardson, and Saul Terry after the break. <laughs>
to my friends, I really have tried from time to time to understand land claims, and you will probably accuse me of being a simple-minded nit, but for the average non-Aboriginal to understand it, you've got to tell us at some time, and we're going to attempt a series in this, I know, what you want. Do you want all the royalties on, on the land? Do you want all the royalties in the timber? Do you want all the fish in the rivers? Or is that a matter where you would and do, do, do you want all of the Queen Charlotte? Do you want all of Vancouver Island? I think or are you going to give Jack, us some specifics which the ordinary man can say, now that's reasonable, let's force our government to talk. Mm. Okay, I think that's a good point, Jack. Uh, let's be reasonable. And what has perpetuated this issue for so long has been the unreasonableness from, on the part of the governments. And I, I cite the potlatch laws of 1884 that that said that acted against Indian people directly against Indian people because that was the basis of, of Indian government. And right I will there. cite Alan Williams who started a survey and was doing very well on basic negotiations and Bennett wouldn't let him talk any further. Am I correct? It's because it's well known that Alan Williams was the only member of the whole cabinet that believed that That's there should right. even be discussions with Indian people, let but alone let alone changing the policies towards right. Indian people. Well, what about my thesis to you that for the ordinary voter who's a guy who can put pressure in government he wants to know what you want. Well, Jack, let's let's yeah. let's dealing it deal with it then in terms of of uh, the taxpayer's mind. Right now, there is such a huge state of dependency in Indian communities. Uh, the percentage of num number of Indian people who who rely on the welfare state net. Surely, to God, as a taxpayer, they must understand that if you have healthy, vibrant Indian communities who are self-reliant, who have their own economies then you don't have that state of dependency, which is a big drain to the taxpayer in this country. Good point. So we want, we, want a, uh, we want strong Indian communities that have strong economies. On an economic base on settled land claims. That's right, and it has to be, because you can't do it with 16-acre reserves. Miles. You've got to remember, and all the, all the people of this province should realize that there are solutions to this issue. There are solutions that are acceptable to everyone within the parameters of, of Canadian Federation. There is that opportunity in front of us right now. Canada or in British Columbia is not going to pay us for all of the lands that we have. They don't have enough money. We need, as was mentioned over and over, we need to coexist as peoples. We are peoples. We're peoples who've existed in our homelands for hundreds of generations. We have a problem right now on the ownership and jurisdiction over our homelands, over our territories. And we need to address those. We need to address those as the courts of this province has, have very clearly stated that it's a political yeah. issue, a political issue between nations to take care of this unfinished business. The people of British Columbia want this issue dealt with. Where are we going to find politicians that are responsible enough to take on this very fundamental issue to Canada? and very fundamental issue now, to all of our futures. There's nothing I can disagree with in what you said, except that when it comes to the bit, you're up against the government which will say, we can't afford to do it unless the feds pay for it. We will not negotiate. And what are they going to pay for? Well, how yeah, can, that's, how that's, can you say they can't afford it and when there's been no negotiations or no, no terms come to yet? It may be a fear and, tactic. It yeah. may be a scare well, tactic. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's the same type of thing that's been the same time type of game that's being played with the IWA. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any group in British Columbia that's put one penny on the table as being a demand in, in, in the negotiations. So what is the province going to pay for? As usual, it's, it's fantasy. Well, you know? Oh, now, come oh, now. It is. Come you, now, John, well, it's not fantasy. Well, where, where is the money? What the province is saying, but they're not saying it out in the public, is that the province has demanded of the federal government that the federal government pay for any land which has to be turned over to the Indian people. Right. Now that's what they're talking about in money. Now with the way we see it, we say, what, what is the province going to be paid for? If they took the land from us to begin with, are they suggesting that the federal government has now got to buy it off them that when, after they've taken it away from the Indians well, to give back to the Indians? Are, That's hypocrisy. No, no. There are, there are many other interests, including the tree farm license holders, with whom you're well familiar and perhaps a bit critical, and the mi people who get the mining royalties, and the fishing industry, Indian, Brotherhood, and non-Indian, 
all of these things are going to have to be adjusted to give you a better financial return. Am I correct? And there is every opportunity for us to do that. Jack, you're, you're familiar with the responsible way in which the Haida Nation for 13 years tried to negotiate the, our concerns over South Moresby as one issue mm -hmm. in particular. We use the political process, we use the planning processes, and we use the courts. At every turn, we were rebuffed. We were pushed aside as though we had nothing to say in our homeland. Look, finally, uh, finally, we had to take a position, and we're still taking a strong position on that. We cannot ever resolve this situation by pretending that it doesn't in exist. Other words, what I'm learning from you, or what I hope to learn from the interviews I'm going to do with the, on the six Pacific claims, is that it's very difficult to get a um, table of a price settlement. It's very difficult to put a specific price or specific demands on the table until you get down to free negotiation. Nobody has agreed a to negotiate price. with the Indian people as yet. No one has yeah. agreed to negotiate. We're price. hoping that one day somebody will. Jack, yes, Jack, but the uh, policies, uh, excuse me, uh, George, uh, the policies indicate that there's going to be no just settlement, at least on a, in terms of the policies being put forward by the federal government even now. If you look at the Nielsen Task Force reports, you can see that as, as, as any indica indication that the ongoing policies of, of alienating people from the land is, is going to continue. And so I, I, and that is why there are about seven tribes or seven nations in this province who refuse to put in their, submit their land claims. And also, uh, two of those that submitted um, uh, wished to pull out, and they will refuse the, the access to opportunity well, to take Well, now, you've, you've got an action on Mears Island coming. And yeah. the, uh, there are two, the twin tracking action, the Mears Island action, and the Gits, Gitsan action, right? Yeah. And they're all going to be tried together in the Supreme Court. Well, hopefully not. Uh, hopefully this whole mess will be uh, resolved by the Appeal Court of BC as to whether or not there are separate cases. We understand that there are supposed to be separate cases the way the Appeal Court has ruled. Miles, put it to me. I'm going to take some phone calls, but put it to me to the reasonable non-Aboriginal why he should campaign with Van der Zand to settle the Indian land claims in a reasonable manner. There, in this province, our people have always stated very clearly our philosophy is of sharing. We've never ever told other people that they, we desire them to leave our homelands, that we desired them to get out and leave us alone. What we have been stating is that we need to work out the relationships between ourselves as nations, as people, on how we can exist side by side. Not that we want to be assimilated into Canadian society ever, that, but that we will retain our cultural identity and to live together with the peoples that we share our lands with, with, with certainty, Mm. And I love your words. It's just that if I were a politician trying to sell it and listen to you, I'm still going to say, do you want self-determination? What's it going to cost me? If you look at what the Prime Minister has been stating continually in, in terms of the South Africa issue, in terms of many issues, that Canada has a long tradition of defending dem democracy and freedom throughout the world. You know, who are we? We're a nation of people who have existed on Hadaguay for 10,000 years. Don't we're we're not asking... Canada to recognize anything more than what's ours. It's, it's unfinished business that we must get on and on get on with. And our people have very clearly stated that the fundamental issue to the Haida Nation is the lands, seas, and resources. How those are managed and how our relationship to those is governed. And we, as a nation, choose through what you might term our right to self-determination, or however you want to term it, we choose to exercise that through our governments. Well, and, let me put and, a question and, and to you. And we will deal with these issues of you, negotiating our differences and managing our relationships between those governments. For instance, if I, if I speculate correctly, you want 300 miles of the seas off the shores of Vancouver Island for your fishing. No, we want to be able to exercise certain rights in those waters. You which want 200 would, miles. Which wouldn't exclude, exclude non-Indian people from using those same Has waters. No have you, uh, one last question, we'll go to the phones. Has no politician ever sat down with you in BC and said, 
Tell us what you want specifically. No, because uh, that, that would uh, stop their, their dancing that they're doing. It Is wouldn't that what's it, needed? It wouldn't allow them to. Of course it's needed. Of course they, it's needed. They know they have the, they're, they're burdened with this uh, trust responsibility to deal with this matter and to assure uh, self-determination to, to Indian people and they have uh, done the opposite. They've, they've okay, um, abused that right. Uh, we've had a long session today and uh, we've already done, as a matter of fact, six interviews on sp six specific last land claims which you shall see in the near future. I hope we've ch shed a little light, but let's chance going to the phones and see what happens, okay? Sure. All right. Fine. <laughs> You must admit, gentlemen, it's tough to get your message across simply, is it not? Yeah, Jack, because what they're asking us to do is to put forth our negotiating position before anybody agrees to negotiate, and that's always difficult. That's a good point. Would you endorse that? That is clearly, we have to deal with these issues through negotiation. But to me, you would say that if they negotiate, you will be clear, concise, and reasonable. Our people would have a, a document on the table tomorrow if they agree to negotiate. There has to be principles agreed to on how they're going to negotiate. That's good. And Jack, I think the reasonableness and the responsibility of our people has been proven. Go ahead, please. Yes, good afternoon, Jack. Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm listening with interest to these people um, that are on your show, and I don't want to sound like a racist. No, please don't. Well, I'm trying not to. <laughs> But it seems to me that Native people always want the best of both worlds. It seems to me that uh, they want the fishing rights, which I, which I do agree that they should have fishing rights in the, in the rivers and things like that, and, and, uh, and certain things in the ocean. I don't agree, though, with the fact that they think that they should be given all this different land or monies for the land because I don't believe that they've shown that they can manage things. Okay, properly. that's a good comment. Take it from there. I don't, I don't think we've been given an opportunity to be able to prove that, and I think that's, that's high time that we given that opportunity. Well, our cultures have survived, our peoples have survived in these lands for over 10,000 years. Look what's happened in the last 200. I think you, people should have a look at that. I absolutely agree, and besides that, I disagree. I think that we've proven that, that we can manage well. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. And Mr. Webster, uh, just in background, I'm a fourth generation Canadian of, of English descent and I uh, understand their land claims and I hear about uh, the Aboriginal rights of uh, the Indians and your guests there, but I have a, a point of view that I haven't really seen expressed and uh, in brief, uh, they have their land claims and, and they want compensation uh, for what uh, our society has uh, taken from them. But I never hear mentioned what our society has given to them. I notice that they, they go to hospitals. I, mean, I assume your guests have flown down here in modern aircraft. They're wearing uh, polyester shirts and uh, tailored jackets. They use uh, stainless steel fishing hooks and outboard motors and chainsaws. Uh, this is all things that, that, that we have developed that in some cases we brought uh, from the other countries with us. Okay. And uh, they seem to enjoy uh, the benefits of our society, and yet now they, they want compensation for all their claims. Uh, right. Okay, that's Medi's point. Uh, that, that's, that's the South African argument. As long as you allow, you allow people to have certain things, you can deny them their basic human rights. Well, that's unacceptable. And, and secondly, he keeps on mentioning this compensation for the land. I wonder if he might refer us to a document that states where Indian people are demanding compensation. Because I think Jimmy Gosnell from the Nishka Tribal Council has, has said it well. Uh, nobody can ever afford to buy this province of us. They will never have enough money in the banks of Canada to buy this uh, province. So there's no sense in even talking about what, is, what has gone. There isn't enough money around to pay for the past. But you want a bit of it back. We want, the, we want the land and the resources back, a certain portion of it. Keep your money. Your money depreciated 50% in Switzerland in three months. Your money Why too. would it be so foolish to go and take a dollar if it's only going to be worth 70 cents tomorrow? <clears throat> Jack, just also, we should remember that, that we're not asking for anything. We're asking for recognition of what is rightfully ours. And we're asking for recognition of that in the spirit of the Canadian Federation and in the spirit of international law. Basic human dignity, basic human rights they're based on. And also, we're not talking about the past. We're not talking about things that have happened in the last 
200 years. Those could never be righted. We're talking about today. You're asking for recognition. And you're asking for, to some extent for title. You're asking for a share of the resources. You're asking in some cases for self-determination. Well, it's, to, to me, the way I look at it is, okay, we're asking for recognition of our title. What does that mean? It means that we should have some kind of share in the, in the lands, resources. But your answer and, was the best and also You said authority. the moment it's set down to negotiate, you'll be specific. Very specific. Oh, yeah. and, and, means and, and that's the part I don't understand about the hysteria that's being put around this province about we want the whole province and we want billions it's of dollars. It's been said by Indian leaders. No, 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 it isn't. <laughs> it's been said by, by, by the Attorney General of British Columbia. Now, to me, that only, the only, that only says that the Attorney General of British Columbia doesn't have very much confidence in the negotiator that he would send to the table if he's already given away all those things to us. First of all, I hope the negotiator is that weak when he gets to the table and gives us all those things, but I don't think he's going you to. You know his position, his position and the position of the Van der Zand government is that the feds agreed to pick up the tab and costs and dollars and cents, they'll then negotiate. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just a red herring. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, my feeling is that uh, we are all Canadians, and I think um, somehow Canadians such as myself, who, you know, I'm only 30 years old, but my family's been in Canada for five generations. I think we have the rights that, that these people have. And I think what the conception is is that people are, are feeling that they're trying to deny that we have also have those rights to the land and to the resources. And I think if we were better informed, perhaps we wouldn't have these negative feelings. Um, we, are, we are Canadians. I think that's the Thank primary you, point. Thank and you, I think under, under your theory, uh, 27,000 or 27 million Russians can move to Canada and take over Canada, and then we would all be Russians. I don't think I'd, that theory would hold very much water with Canadian citizens. As long as you get off the coast on a lifeboat, you can get in here oh. no bother at all. Oh, the, <laughs> according to his theory, you can move anywhere in the world and, and, and start to rule it, and it's acceptable. I don't think that that's true at all. But that's another thing that we've got to remember, this notion that we're all properly Canadians, freely uh, participating in this democratic process. We've never been given an opportunity to be fully Canadian. You didn't get the vote until the early 50s or the late 40s, did you? Well, well, not only that, we were forbidden to acquire land. The legislation specifically said Chinese and Indians couldn't acquire it as 300 acres per family. You look at, look at what happened on Lyle Island. It never came clearer to me then when we stood before the B.C. Supreme Court and that judge told us, as Canadian citizens, you have no right to protect your homelands. As Haidas, we've always had that responsibility. There's no place in Canadian law that has any, there's no, any respect because Any recognition of our place in our homeland agreed, as Haida. And I would agree with you on that because the, the non-Aboriginal system set up title, gave it to people, gave them permission to cut the trees, right? Jack, Jack the, the, the basic thing that people forget about is that Indian people were not involved in, in, in making decisions on what is being set up for us now. And I think that that's what people are, Indian people are asking for is that consent of uh, accepting what is the status quo? We Indians, have we have that choice of either Indians, accepting that or else fighting for the how many Aboriginals of our title. are there in British Columbia? I'm sorry. How many Aboriginals are there in British Columbia? Oh well, hundreds, excess of hundred thousand. Excess of hundred thousand. How many non-Aboriginals are there? Two and a half million. Two and a half million. Well, I don't think that that uh, that uh, argument uh, holds anything with me because uh, I think it's uh, political will of the people of British Columbia to settle justly and fairly with Indian people in this, in this province, which, I would agree which with has that. to agree but with, with know our homelands. Mm. We have uh. to sit down at the negotiating table and flesh those out. And let me make another point clear, that, that my comments about us not being Canadians were not meant to be a slight on Canadian citizens or, or anyone, but that what we're asking in the possibility of that right and proper relationship with Canada is to sit down and negotiate these issues and freely determine that political status. Miles, it'd be a lot easier for us to understand if we had some idea, and I hate to be a crass, non-Aboriginal Canadian, what it's going to cost, what it's going to do to industry, what it's going to do to Macmillan Bledel, what it's going to do to the fishing industry. Look at all the trouble we've had on the fishing industry recently. Yeah, with the because bylaw. Because, yeah. because of the fact that, that the governments uh, fail to or wish 
not to deal with the it, matter was the Indian people. It, it, I've, it, just a minute, have I taken this call? I've spoken to you. Go ahead. Hello? Yes. Jack? Yes. Okay, three points. Right. Uh, quickly, uh, the uh, gentleman extremely on your extreme right there uh, is the gentleman I want to first uh, talk to, Mr. W, I think his name is. Mr. Watts. Uh, well, first of all, in connection with his remark about uh, Mr. Van der Zam and the troop bulbs, uh, 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 where having in mind that he had to eat those during the war. Uh, I'm a, my profession is a bank manager with a prominent bank in Canada where I've been for 20 years. I know all kinds of people. Okay, don't give me the background. Give I'll me your comment. I'll give you the background because I've met all the Indians and uh, I've met a lot of, uh, of other people too. And, and the first thing that comes to mind is I'd like to make a remark about that. I am from the same country as Mr. Van der Zam. not that that makes any difference, but I, he was lucky that he had them because we, we weren't able to get you bulbs to eat. And you never saw any fat Dutchmen during the Second World War. Well, that's a known fact, and they were greatly Some admired. Them don't look like they ever ate them because they yeah. look slightly overweight uh, in, uh, on your program. Well, no, make no, one no. comment on the topic, please. Tulip bulbs are not on well, the topic. During my travels, uh, uh, I'm, uh, as far as the, uh, I think they have a certain right to to some of the of the land that we have. But I traveled through the Okanagan and uh, Kamloops and West Bank and met the chiefs of the other Indian bands there, and I have never seen so much money. Okay, they're not all like that, believe you me. He made his point that he believes you're entitled to the land. Well, he, he missed the point. That's I think he kind of missed the point, but it's difficult to keep the point. I'm sometimes guilty of it myself. The, the, the point is, is that many people uh, migrated to Canada to escape oppression. And in coming to, to get rid of their oppression, they brought oppression to other people. That was the point that I tried to make. Maybe you're trying to do too much at, in one fell swoop. Yeah, it's when you try to understand it internationally, I guess sometimes I some people's maybe, minds well, become Well, gentlemen, closed. I you promise you, expect too much too I'm me. grateful for your presence here tonight, Saul Terry. Yours two, Miles Richardson. Yours two, George, George Watts. I'm going to present six specific Indian land claims headed by the tribal spokesman. Uh, almost instantly on my program, and I want you to watch them with sympathy and in the light of this background, hopefully to understand them. Thank you, gentlemen. I'll be back after the break. University of Cape Town. I've been there on the trip trip. Mm -hmm. Most impressive. Yeah. Change of topic. I have with me tonight a noted South African economist brought here by the Fraser Institute, and his name is Brian Cantor, professor of economics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. There was a day when I would have said, oh, isn't it beautiful to come in from the sea and look at Table Mountain? Nobody thinks of you as a tourist resort now. People just think of you as a land of the most damnable oppression, which is blackening the eye of all free countries throughout the world. Is that a fair comment about the world's, the Western world's attitude to South Africa? It's fair. Most people would take that position. Uh, not everybody. And there's still people who visit South Africa, not as many as as one would like to see visit. I think it's still a good place to visit, though. The 12 common market countries, oh, Prime Minister Mulroney would be annoyed to he hear you saying that because he closed the tourism board off office yes, yes, and well, scrapped some ads. But yes. the point of the interview is that 12 common market countries agreed today to ban new investments in South Africa. Now, what have they done that's different, and what will it, have, what will it do to the economy of South Africa? Well, it won't do much good. In fact, I think the... Uh, sanctions will do a great deal of, of harm. And, and in fact, the threat of sanctions has already done harm. It's, uh, it's encouraged extremes in South Africa. Uh, sanctions, international pressure, is not helpful to peaceful change in South Africa. It's anything but. Is that merely because of the intense stubbornness of the Bota government and its political philosophies? Well, like any government, they want to survive. I mean, they, they, they're elected by a white electorate, as, as you know, and, and uh, unless they give their voters what they think their government should be giving them, they'll be voted out. And they'll be voted out on the right, and not on the left, by people who think that they can do better in maintaining order in South Africa. Just a minute, let me yes. get that clear. You yes. say that the more economic pressure there is in South Africa, 
the more chance that the really extreme right-wing yeah. elements yeah. will take over the government and start the bloodbath. Well, yes, act, act more, more extremely. Act more extremely. I think that is the alternative. Unless this government provides what the voters, the white voters regard as, a, as an appropriate degree of law and order, they will be voted out and, and replaced by people who think that they can do better on the law and order issue. You're telling I, me that in your opinion, therefore, the majority of white voters in South Africa would support greater oppression for the sake of law and order? If, it, if it's necessary to their survival, yes. And I think many other groups of people put under similar pressure would react in exactly the same way. When you push people into a corner, they fight back. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's happened in South Africa already. I think the South African government, and you shouldn't regard me as necessarily a supporter of the South African no, government. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just describing. Point. You're giving me a clinical interpretation. I'm trying to, yes. The, the, the South African government decided some months ago that there was nothing they could do within the politically feasible set that is consistent with their survival that would satisfy foreign opinion and hold off, uh, and hold off uh, And one of the steps they haven't taken, of course, is free Mandela. No, no but, they're not confident, unfortunately not confident enough to do that. Because Mandela would not renounce violence on behalf of the African no. National Congress. Correct. He was offered a conditional release, as you know, he decided not to take it. I think Mandela himself is probably one of the people caught in the middle. He's, 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 he's caught in the middle. He's caught between these extremes. Without many South Africans. The are. international pressure has been in South Africa now for how many years? Ten? Well, I think it's longer than that. And uh, one wouldn't want to argue that all of that pressure has been unhelpful to change. Because I can remember uh, the, the, the diamond barons uh, pleading publicly for some kind of softening of the apartheid regulations. Did they not? Yes. Apartheid is not in the sense of discrim racial discrimination in the labor market in the sense of denying them as employers freedom to employ who they wished at wage rates freely negotiated. Those freedoms are, are not helpful to business. Apartheid has, has in that sense, has, has been unhelpful to economic development in South Africa. And, and business has appreciated that point and has asked, always, or mostly asked for, for, for greater freedom. Greater freedom for the labor force or greater freedom for them? To hire and, and freedom for, for workers to supply labor. All right, when did the uh, sanctions become a, a, a factor in the situation? There have been limited sanctions from yes. some areas now, like many people, many institutions have withdrawn their investments from well, the, the companies that deal with South Africa. Yes, but that is not government-imposed sanctions. Those were, were private decisions, decisions taken without government influence by uh, banks and others who had supplied capital to South Africa, to decision was taken to withdraw that capital. And that, that South Africa has in fact had very little net inflows of capital for 10 or more years. In fact, it hasn't had substantial withdrawals of capital. It's, mm. it's that problem that, that, that manifested itself this time last year. But the 12 common markets agreed today at Sesia yes. to ban new investments in That's South right. Africa. New direct investments. That will be felt. Well, it closes, it, it won't be felt directly because we haven't had m direct investment inflows of any magnitude, we've had outflows. But the, the hope, I think, in South Africa was that you would, by following the right kinds of economic policies, doing what is regarded as the appropriate uh, uh, things, you would be able to attract fresh capital. But now, now you won't. No, no. And the incentive to meet the terms on, upon which capital has previously been supplied is removed. In other words, you're saying that South African people with money borrowed from overseas, facing this new ban on, ban on new investments, might say, I'm not going to hurry to pay off my debts. Yeah, no, they won't. They'll say, we, why should we pay if, in fact, there's, there's no return to us? That's the danger. That's the kind of polarization that these steps bring. What about the imports of South African iron, steel, and gold coins? The 12 common market countries have agreed to halt imports of these things. Yes. Well, that's bad news for the uh, iron and steel producers in South Africa. They're not allowed to sell in Europe. Uh, it's probably quite good news for the people in South Africa capable of converting iron and steel into products, which they could then sell abroad, which, of course, uh, indicates some of the, uh, the uh, responses that may be taken. There was a move to import ban uh, at West German insistence, these economic common market countries dropped the plan to import a ban on South African coal. Yes. Would that have hit the country very hard? It would have been 
more disruptive in that the coal mining industry is, is, a, is an even more important industry than the steel industry. We're talking about many more people employed in that industry. We're talking about large sales of coal to the European community. I think South African coal accounts for about 20% of all coal imports. Mm -hmm. It would have been very disruptive of the, of the industry in South Africa and of, of, of industry in, in Europe, which would have had to seek out alternative suppliers. It would have been very helpful to two alternative suppliers in that they could have looked to, to higher prices for their coal. Now, Britain is one of the 12 common market countries which has gone along with these new yes. bans, is yes. it not? Yes. Is that a big, would that be a big disappointment after? Yes, I think it is. Because, because Mrs. Thatcher was very clear on the principle. She didn't think san sanctions would help affect desirable change in South Africa. And I think she's right about that. But she's gone along. She's been taken along. With the, with the clamor, she has not stood against that. And I'm personally very, very disappointed in her. There is a principle at stake here. Do you think sanctions will help? And the answer, I think, should be no. And she knows that that's the correct answer. And well, uh, it, would help the, it would help to create an end for the Boto government if it were kept up. Total ban on no, trade. I don't think so. I don't think so. You don't not tell me all. more about it, and I'll take some calls too after the break. The, the Boto government... <laughs> I must, fair to you, must be fair to you, Professor Cantor from the University of Cape Town, uh, because what you're telling me is the impact, of, as an economist, is the impact of sanctions. Which way do you go? Do you like the Bota government? No, not personally. I would vote against them, and I have voted against them. But uh, You don't uh, endorse racial discrimination of this flagrant not. type? No, indeed not. I would wish... South Africa to be a, a multiracial society in the full sense of that term, a multiracial democracy. It's a question of how you achieve those results. Could it have been done overnight by any post-war prime minister? No, no. Had no. to be in stages. It has to be a process. It has to be politically possible. And, and uh, the whites have to be reconciled to it. And uh, the, for a long period in the post-war history of South Africa, the tendency was the other way towards racial exclusivism. I think, uh, to the credit of the Boerta government, they've tried to move away from that with, with great difficulty. One sometimes gets the feeling that Boerta would like to go a little bit faster and further in kind of court freedom, but his right-wing element won't let him. Well, I think, I don't know. But certainly the right-wing element is there to restrain him. Now, if sanctions were totally applied against South Africa by the British, and this is not a total ban on, uh, this is not total sanctions, is it? No. What proportion of sanctions would this be on a scale of 1 to 10? I think it's about, uh, uh, against what has happened already, it's probably, uh, it's a probably 1. In other words, there's a hell of a lot more yet that could be sanctioned to really to hurt well, South Africa. Well, theoretically, you could embargo all South African trade at great cost. And what would happen then? Well, firstly, one would, one would want to know to what extent those embargoes would work, to what extent they'd be effective. One would be entitled to be very skeptical about their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the more you create barriers to trade, the more incentive you provide for people to work their way around those No, but you're telling me that South Africa could survive regardless with its quite powerful industrial machine and its backdoor access to other places. Well, I think uh, South Africa, as you know, is specializes in gold production. And if anything's designed to beat embargoes, it's gold, high value uh, relative to weight. I mean, in other words, not... I see they, they, they attacked the gold coins, but they didn't attack the yes. gold. Yes, so you sell fewer gold coins, other countries sell more, but you continue to sell your gold and you miss out on the premium you get for coining them. And the gold is now freely available from South Africa from, from the EEC countries as well, yes. is it? Yes. In other yes. words, say, we want your gold, we just want to annoy oh, you with the other thing. Of course. You want, you want symbols. Well, ideally, you have your symbols at low cost. Uh, uh, in, in make the point that I don't think sanctions do any good, so let's, let's try and minimize the damage. That's probably the way Mrs. Thatcher has been, has been uh, thinking. And sanctions cannot bring down the border government. It cannot. It, can, it has strengthened it already. Sanctions have been a rallying call that the Boerta government have used. And does it worsen the conditions of the underprivileged in South Africa? Unemployment, short, for instance. Short term, to the extent you disrupt 
trade, you're going to affect unemployment. You're going to increase it. There's short-term disruptive effects. Well, you've been very frank and forthright and comprehensible to me. I have time for a couple of calls. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I would like to know what your guest feels the result of these sanctions, what, what the outcome of these sanctions will be. Um, I, I don't understand why he doesn't believe that they are going to have any effect and how he feels um, about the black imposed sanctions in South Africa, the black people who are, who are boycotting, um, people who support apartheid, a lot of these businesses are going under, and don't, doesn't he feel that this is going to have some effect on the Bota government? And what does he feel will work if sanctions don't work? Firstly, um, there are a number of points there, but um, firstly, I don't think san w sanctions will have no effects. I think they will have a f they do have effects. They polarize South Africans. They encourage extremes. They encourage uh, repression. I think that's one of the effects of sanctions. Uh, it's, it's, people are not easily pushed around, and South Africans aren't very different uh, uh, to other people in that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can encourage them, you can conjole them up to a point, but when you start knocking people around, they usually respond uh, uh, violently. What will work then? What eventually therefore will bring freedom and dignity to the vast mass of one South Africa? One would hope persuasion. Some kinds of pressure, certainly. Certainly the rest of the world is perfectly entitled to tell South Africans that it, it doesn't like them and that uh, uh, offer, offer incentives for South Africans to, to behave themselves. But, I mean, there's a question of how much. How much is effective? And I think the, the, the rest of the world has, is acting irresponsibly with respect to South Africa. So the bloodbath will come before any outside, outside solution could be imposed. I think w what it does is, is, is make that kind of terrible, of those kind of terrible events even more inevitable. That's, that's what it's doing. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Uh, hi. Uh, one of the things that I was going to say that I think sanctions uh, in the short term probably wouldn't do much good in the long term it shows that uh, people uh, the people of the rest of the world don't agree with what they're doing. And one of my suggestions would, were that maybe if, if some of the countries in the outlying regions, you know, there's other South, uh, uh, countries in Af Africa, if they could uh, take a loss in some of their products to some of the European nations, say, you know, to, to put, if they're really against the South Africa's uh, Mr. Mayor, does that make any sense to you? Well, I think here is raising the issue of short term and long term. I would say short term sanctions can be disruptive. I think long term they will have the effect over the long term of driving away as they've had already driving away capital driving away skills that are essential to the economic development of South Africa so I think what happens is that the eventual outcomes where are that the blacks we'll of see. course rule South Africa in proportion to to their numbers but what they will have to rule will be a much lesser economy and there'll be much, much uh, sacrifice along the, uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. So, It's a tough one. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to ask your guest, uh, comparatively speaking, in the United States, the average wage of the, United, of the black workers yeah. uh, is far less, uh, I believe, in the neighborhood of 50% than the white population. What would that be comparatively in South Africa? Well, for people in employment in the formal sector of the economy, the racial uh, wage and salary differences of the order of four, three to four, perhaps five to one. That's an average. My thanks to Brian Cantor, Professor of Economics at the University of Cape Town, for your frank and illuminating answers. I shall be back after the break. <laughs> Who knows what tomorrow will bring, but it will bring Claude Richmond, for sure, the Minister of Tourism, to answer some questions from us on the final balance sheet on Expo. Because we're getting to that time where we want to know what the score is. Magnificent success though it has been. Webster, live at 5, back tomorrow at 5, and don't forget to stay tuned for Tony and the News Hour.